morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, February 9th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Ugandan police warn against any so-called illegal protest today, Thursday. We appeal to members of the public not to participate in any illegal demonstration. Whoever participates in any illegal demonstration shall be arrested and charged to court. A group of Western envoys are in Sudan to show support for the new framework agreement. Somalia's government and humanitarian agencies appeal for $2.6 billion in humanitarian assistance. Syria's rebel-held areas reel from earthquakes. We'll have analysis of U.S. President Joe Biden's State of the Union address to Congress. Nigeria's Supreme Court suspends the deadline for a currency swap. I think we should start respecting the sanctity of institutions. The CBN is operating based on the laws in and powers that he has. This is not arbitrary. So I don't even think that the Supreme Court should have entertained that issue. And traditional leaders in Liberia ban female genital mutilation. Those stories plus our Black History Month facts for today are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Ugandan police have warned political activists against any protest today, Thursday. Spokesperson Patrick Oyango says the police have intelligence that protesters are planning to attack human rights offices and other government installations. He says such demonstrations will be illegal because police have received no notification. The government announced this week that it had decided not to renew the permit for the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in Kampala beyond its current term. The Ugandan Foreign Ministry cited prevailing peace throughout Uganda, coupled with strong national human rights institutions and a vibrant civil society. Therefore, it says there is no need for a human rights office. Police spokesperson Oyango says anyone participating in what he calls illegal demonstrations will be arrested and charged. We have received intelligence information that there are political activists who are planning to demonstrate tomorrow, 9th February 2023, starting as early as 7 a.m. in Kampala. The demonstrators are planning to attack human rights offices and other government installations. The Inspector General of Police has not received any notification from any person or organization of any intended demonstration. Any person or organization that wants to demonstrate should first seek clearance from the Inspector general of police we appeal to members of the public not to participate in any illegal demonstration whoever participates in any illegal demonstration shall be arrested and charged to court we also appeal to members of the public not to be lured into participating in illegal activities if you try to participate in any illegal activities The police will be ready to apprehend you, charge you, and take you to court. That was Ugandan police spokesperson Patrick Oyango speaking at a news conference Wednesday in Kampala. Ugandan civil society and human rights organizations were not immediately available to answer whether they were planning a protest today Thursday. A group of Western envoys are in Sudan to meet with various stakeholders to show their support for the framework agreement. Representatives from the European Union, Germany, the U.S., Norway, and France arrived in Khartoum on Wednesday for a series of meetings with different Sudanese political actors. Michael Atit reports for VOA from Khartoum. Six envoys and representatives from five countries and the European Union met with the Sudanese politicians to show their support for the ongoing political framework agreement in the country. Peter Lord is the United States Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Africa, Sudan and South Sudan. Speaking shortly after the meeting, he said they are in Khartoum to acquaint themselves with the ongoing political process in Sudan. It is clear the December 5 political framework agreement is the best basis to form the next civilian-led government in Sudan and the best basis to establish constitutional arrangements for a transitional period that results in elections. 
On December 5th, Sudanese civilian and military leaders signed a power-sharing deal that raised hope of ending violent clashes between security and protesters since last year's coup. The agreement was widely praised as a step toward a civilian-led transitional government and democratic elections. According to Al Jazeera, the accord aims to guide Sudan's civilian lead transitional towards election and criminalize military coup moving forward. It is the first of at least two phases includes new regulations regarding military duties and companies. The paper says the plan stipulates that the military will form part of a new security and defense council under the appointed prime minister. The agreement also vows to unify Sudan's armed forces and impose controls on military-owned companies. In early January, various Sudanese political forces who were signatories to the December's framework agreement launched a discussion on army and security reforms, the Juba Peace Agreement, transitional justice, and dismantling elements of former President Omar al-Bashir's government. Some forces that did not sign the deal, including the grassroots pro-democracy network, the Resistance Committee, complained that the deal does not address reform to judiciary system and the military. Ambassador Lord says it is the hope of the envoys that the framework agreement will mark the new beginning of forming a civilian-led government in Sudan, which will prepare the nation for the elections. It is our strong hope that the parties will make a quick formation of a civilian-led government that is able to lead Sudan out of its current political economic crises that face it. Khalid Omar Yusuf, the official spokesperson for the ongoing political process, welcomes the visit of the six Western envoys and says it is a good opportunity for them to know the challenges facing the process in Sudan. They express their understanding about challenges facing the political process in Sudan and their readiness to fully support all the actors to reach an urgent political solution in a short time. The envoys are expected to continue with a meeting with different Sudanese stakeholders, including civil society, youth and women. Michael Atid, for VOA News, Khartoum, Sudan. The Somali government and humanitarian agencies in the country have appealed for over two and a half billion U.S. dollars to assist about 7.6 million people. Wednesday's appeal in Mogadishu said over 8 million people, nearly half of the population, need immediate humanitarian and protection assistance. Rina Galani is the U.N. Family Prevention and Response Coordinator who has just visited Somalia this week. Haroun Maruf of the U.S. Somali Service asked her about the fears of potential famine in the country. So this year, yes, there were very, very strong fears that um, the criteria that the technical people use to declare a famine may be reached. Um, in many ways, Haroun the distinction between a declaration of famine and what people are actually experiencing is, is meaningless. There are people starving today and in, in very large numbers. Um, in Somalia, we estimate that about over 300,000 people are facing starvation today. Now, the reason this happened is because the world did not respond in time. So looking forward, we need to make sure that famine does not happen and we urgently need to continue to scale up the response that the humanitarian and government agencies have done. And civil society, to be honest, Somalis are always the first and the fastest on the front line. But we need the early money to do that. Otherwise, there is a prediction that we will face famine and a very high number of people um, will be facing starvation. In fact, um, the numbers are projected by April, May to be around over 700,000 people. That's the population of Washington. Uh, so the scale is enormous if we don't keep racing to make sure we pull, keep this pulled back. And regarding the response by the international community, today has been a very important day for you. What's your plan regarding seeking support from the international community to prevent famine and support people who are in need? So today, um, the government actually launched what they call an appeal, a humanitarian appeal. And that plan is um, a combined effort 
to assess the number of people we need to be able to provide life-saving aid to in 2023. That number is 7.6 million people. And for that, the international community is seeking an appeal for $2.6 billion. Now, what's needed is um, many, many countries to support. Rina Galani is the UN Famine Prevention and Response Coordinator who has just visited Somalia this week. She spoke from Mogadishu with Harun Marouf of the US Somali Service. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I'm James Butty in Washington. Today is Thursday, February 9th. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The Syrian-controlled enclave of Atlib on the Turkish border is reeling from Monday's two deadly earthquakes. The region has already been devastated by years of civil war, and aid agencies now say the need for international assistance is urgent. For VOA, Doreen Jones reports from Istanbul. Monday's two deadly earthquakes devastated the Syrian rebel-controlled Idlib province on Turkey's border. But out of the destruction, miraculous stories of survival, like Abu Yazam Mada. <laughs> Mada said, the ground cracked beneath us and we started falling through the building. We felt like we were in an elevator and you go down to the bottom floor so very quickly. And then the ceiling and walls fell over our heads and our bodies. Mada and his family were rescued by the civil defense force, commonly known as the White Helmets. But Mada's son Habib died. Mada himself sustained injuries, as did his daughter. The sheer scale of the destruction is pushing the white helmets to the limit as they contend with freezing winter conditions. Obida Othman Othman is the director of the Civil Defence Centre in Samanda. He said we have made a very great effort to get the injured and dead out of the rubble. Despite the freezing conditions and little air in the destroyed buildings, we are still continuing. For the past 36 hours, we have not stopped getting people out of the rubble. The deadly quakes have destroyed much of what little infrastructure remained from more than a decade of civil war. As a result, aid agencies say there is a desperate need for international support. Yaksan Shishakli is the co-founder of the Maran Foundation, an aid agency working in Syria. It's crazy building on the ground. People are hopeless. They don't know what to do. No aid yet. And this is very important. No aid yet came to Idlib. And people don't know how, if they will receive aid or no aid. So we're really devastated. We need everything. But medical supplies are so important. Blankets, uh, food, and that's what we really need right now. While border crossings with Turkey are open, many of the roads to those borders have been severely damaged by the devastating quakes. It's still unclear when aid will arrive in Idlib. Still, Madar says he is thankful. He said all my neighbours were killed and I'm still living with my family, even though my son was killed. So this is a great thing and a favor from God that I'm still living with my family. But with the Idlib region still awaiting international assistance, the threat of disease, cold and hunger hangs over the quake-stricken area that has already endured more than a decade of fighting. Doreen Jones of VOA News, Istanbul. U.S. President Joe Biden delivered his State of the Union address to Congress on Tuesday night. He opened his speech with a call for bipartisan cooperation, but quickly moved on to trumpeting his economic wins. He challenged Republicans not to undo it. Viewers Carol Van Dam discussed the speech with Washington Post Chief Correspondent Dan Balls, who agrees that Biden appeared focused, energetic, and even feisty on the topic of protecting America's Social Security and Medicare benefits. I was a very, uh, I think your word feisty is a good word for the, the presentation last night. 
you know, he, he did open with a call for bipartisanship, and I think that's a genuine part of uh, the president's DNA. I mean, he was more than three decades in the Senate, and I think that that has made him the kind of, you know, person who always is looking for ways to have bipartisan cooperation. But um, on the other hand, he really had an agenda that he wanted to push. I thought the most interesting parts of the speech, obviously, were the somewhat unscripted moments, not entirely unscripted, but when he when he challenged the Republicans, particularly uh, those who have called for sunsetting Social Security or sunsetting entitlement programs. And that exchange was, was quite striking because he was thinking and acting on his feet. And as, uh, as Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution noted this morning in a piece he wrote on, on their website, he may have won the war over Social Security right there in the House chamber. He put the Republicans in a box on that. And I think that the president's posture and combativeness was different than some people might have expected. Yeah, he was he was kind of saying, yeah, come on, I'll, I'll take you on. You know, let's go for this. Let's do this. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a question, I think, going in about how much he would acknowledge that people haven't felt the economic changes that have been part of the first two years of legislation. He kind of paid a glancing blow to that by acknowledging, you know, that some people feel left behind and that he gets that. All in all, I think that his presentation was as robust a defense and, and advocacy of of a kind of a populist blue-collar economics that he's made during his presidency. That was Washington Post chief correspondent Dan Balls, who covers national politics, the presidency, and Congress for the newspaper. He was speaking with my colleague Carol Van Dam. Nigeria Supreme Court has suspended the government's deadline to stop the use of old currency notes. The Central Bank of Nigeria had ordered people to swipe out old bank notes for currency with a new design by the February 10 deadline, but the directive led to cash shortages, protests, and some attacks on banks, as Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. The court ruling holds the move by federal authorities and the Central Bank of Nigeria to completely phase out the old 200, 500 and 1,000 Naira bills by this Friday. The Central Bank has yet to respond to the court ruling, which comes ahead of another hearing next week. The decision follows a lawsuit filed by three Nigerian state governors seeking to keep these banknotes in circulation for a while longer. Abdul Hakim Mustafa, the attorney who filed the suit on behalf of the Kogi, Kaduna and Zamfara state governors, said Wednesday the bid to transition to the new notes was causing political instability. However, economist Emeka Okengu says the central bank has been operating within legal parameters and that the high court should not be involved. I don't think they should extend, and I think we should, uh, we should start, you know, re- respecting the sanctity of institutions. The CBN is operating based on the laws in and powers that he has. This is not arbitrary. So I don't even think that the Supreme Court should have entertained that issue. In late October, the central bank redesigned the banknotes to curb crime, ransom payments to kidnappers, and counterfeiting, and to regain control of the amount of money in circulation. Authorities say the measure has been successful, but millions of citizens across the country have been scrambling to get the new notes. The situation has been especially challenging for some 40% of Nigerians in rural areas who have little access to banking services. Daily struggles have resulted in protests and attacks on commercial banks. The CBN has blamed the scarcity of the new money on sabotage by commercial banks and has been cracking down on institutions that are not compliant. On Tuesday, President Mohamed Buhari held a private meeting with the central bank governor and the head of anti-graft agency, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. The closed-door meeting followed pleas for calm as citizens protested the cash shortages. The situation comes ahead of elections set to begin later this month. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. 
The National Chiefs and Elders Council of Liberia has placed a ban on female genital mutilation in Montserrado County, the seat of the capital, Monrovia. The prohibition, according to the head of the group, is part of a move to eliminate FGM throughout the country. Liberia is one of three states in West Africa that has not criminalized the practice. Rita Jorabwe Duo reports from Monrovia. The power invested me in all the parliament from the 15th political division. Sign paper, Masaya Bohen, the Etienne a ban. Chief Zansan Kawa is the head of the National Council of Chiefs and Elders of Liberia. He says traditional schools will continue in Liberia, but FGM is absolutely banned in Montserrado County. Masa Kandaka, head of FGM practitioners, there says the procedure is a tradition and stopping it was not an easy decision to take. But she says she and her fellow Zos have agreed because Chief Kawa is their head and must be respected. The move comes after years of field bans and moratoriums. In fact, a bill to outlaw the practice nationwide has been before the legislature, but does not have enough support because, according to the House's Deputy Speaker, some traditional leaders have threatened lawmakers not to pass the bill. But Liberia's cultural ambassador Judy Andy says the few attempts excluded traditional leaders in the decision to end FGM. She says the ban will be upheld because this is the first time they have committed to ban the procedure. We didn't start talking about FGM today. The process started long ago. The reason you did not see some of us because they were disrespectful. Until those who realize that in order to make sure we ban FGN, we must deal with the practitioners. And we have agreed because the death was taken away and the respect came to us. Also committed to upholding the ban is the head of Muslim Souls in Montserrado, Majula Daremi. She says the United Nations Women Organization and the government of Liberia assured her and others who performed the procedure that they will be provided with alternative economic support. For her part, UN Women Goodwill Ambassador Jaha Dukure says, not much attention is given to supporting practitioners who no longer perform the ritual cutting. Genital mutilation is very, very underfunded around the world. A lot of times people would rather fund other issues relating to women and girls than funding this issue. And if we were anywhere else in the world, and you had parents cutting the fingers of their children, the ears, the nose, or any other body part, the world will cry an outcry. We're urging every single person here, the same way we're asking our people to stop the practice, we're asking you guys also to put your money where your mouth is. Responding to Jaha's request, European Union Ambassador to Liberia, Lauren De La Hoos, says the EU will continue to support the rights of women across Liberia. This even after the end of the EU-UN initiative that focuses on eliminating sexual and gender-based violence, or SGBV. I can assure you that the support of the European Union to fighting SGBV and ending FGM will continue. Before the decision to ban FGM by traditional leaders, the government placed a three-year moratorium on the practice until 2025. Gender Minister William Eto Sedita, on behalf of the government, thanked the traditional leaders and said she is hopeful that before the end of the suspension, a ban to criminalize FGM will be passed. We are already ending the first year, so we have two more years. We are at this point, and we want to see that by the end of the next two years, we will have a law in place, we have done all of this across the country, and we'll be able to have a success story to tell the world that Liberia has officially banned FGM from the entire country. Civil society organizations have raised concerns about the harmful effects of FGM on women and girls including lifelong physical and psychological trauma, including depression. UN Women says about 44% of all women in Liberia have undergone for a procedure, which it considers a human rights violation. Rita Jrawedu for VOA Morovia. February is Black or African American History Month here in the United States. The idea for a Black History Month celebration began on February 1st, 1926 as Negro History Week by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. It became a month-long celebration in 1976. And here now are some African American and African history facts for today, February 9th. 
On this day, 1944, African-American poet, novelist, and short story writer Alice Walker was born in Eatonton, Georgia, into a sharecropper family. Most of her writings talked about the lives of blacks in the South. In 1982, she published the novel The Color Purple, which won the Pulitzer Prize the following year. In 1985, the book was made into a movie starring Oprah Winfrey. And that's it for this Thursday, February 9th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for 